So hi, everybody, and welcome to our second uh, series for our Navigating the Job Search webinar series here at Tripus Minds. We're so excited to welcome you all back. Uh, really appreciate everyone's um, kind of flexibility moving the meeting from like last week to this week. So I hope you guys are having a good week and a good start to your weekend. So today we actually have a very special guest. So we have Sarah, um, and she'll be talking about um, her tips from a technical uh, recruiting standpoint. Um, today, we'll hear about her biggest tips for aspiring data scientists. Um, and as usual, kind of like the flow of our webinar will be, well, I'll introduce her and like do a quick welcome. Then she has a really awesome presentation that she prepared for you guys. So really excited about that. And then we will open the floor up to any questions that you have, as well as like a number of like set questions that we had for her um, kind of coming into this meeting. So as a brief background on Sarah, so she's a passionate, versatile data enthusiast, talent advisor, and trained data scientist, musician, and artist who has experience in creating data-driven solutions, models, and visualizations, as well as project management skills that align with growth and goals. So she has also worked in machine learning, statistics, problem solving, and programming. Um, today, she'll be talking with us about navigating the job search, job search. Specifically, she'll be sharing tips from her experience as a technical recruiter. Um, so again, if you have any um, questions um, during the webinar, uh, we are graced with the presence of Alejandro, who thankfully has been like really like engaged and helping with all of these things and obviously like leading sharpest minds. So if you have any comments or questions at any time, um, you can do three things, either use the raise hand function, um, use the chat function, or use the Q&A feature, um, and we will make sure to get to your questions. Uh, and with that, I will hand the uh, floor over to Sarah to take it away. So Great. Thank you, Amber. That was fantastic and quite a mouthful, I realize, as you're, <laughs> as you're reading all of that. Um, yes, I am Sarah, and I'm just going to dive into the presentation, if that sounds good. That sounds OK. Um, let me just do this really quick. And here we go. OK. Um, that was not what I wanted to share. I wanted to share. It's always, here we go. Okay. All right. So now you can see my screen. You can see navigating the job search. And I'm telling you guys, I'm very excited to be here. Um, and as Amber said, my name is Sarah Jacoby. I'm a talent advisor with Dot .connect. Um, but hopefully one day um, I will be an NLP data scientist at some fun company. Um, so things to look forward to. Uh, so who is Sarah Jacoby? Um, a little background on me. I'm originally from Texas. Um, like I, my parents do have a ranch, so I am a living stereotype. I, I, I lived in New York City for about a decade. Um, I also spent some time in Berlin for two years, and now I live in Connecticut with my partner and two cats. Um, they're my step cats, but I love them just like my own. Um, I am a former opera singer and stand-up comic. So in a fundamental way, I was um, analyzing what was on the page, um, extracting that information from the audience or from a situation, kind of transforming that and then loading it on the audience. So I like to think of it as the original ETL. Um, uh, I have worked and that I've worked in analytics for pretty much my entire career. What I do, I am a data scientist. I am self-taught. I taught myself Python and SQL and a lot of machine learning techniques. And then I felt that I needed to kind of level up. So I did a data science bootcamp with Thinkful. And I am currently, I love NLP, as I mentioned maybe before. Um, I love NLP and text because words um, help you be an opera singer and also a stand-up comic. But uh, I am currently working with a mentor at Sharpest Minds. And I think he's actually um, one of the participants today. So <laughs> excited. Um, let's see, what else? I am also a talent advisor. I am working for Dot .connect. And I have been hiring for a lot of tech roles. That's anything from software engineering roles, um, full stack engineers, uh, founding engineers. We've done a lot of UX, UI roles and several of the data science roles. And I, I'm gonna say data science in quotations here. Um, and I have also worked, um, and that didn't, there we go, consulted with my colleagues on the hiring processes for data scientists, uh, which I find to be very important as we're going to hopefully get into a little bit today. So um, that's about me. Now let's, let's get into the current hiring process um, for data scientists, right? And this is um, a very high level kind of overview perspective that I'm looking at here. Um, 
First, a company needs to, or a department, needs to identify the need for a data scientist and whatever that means. So um, the highlights to remember here are whether or not this is a new role or if it's a replacement. Um, we need a job description and we have to meet from here, we meet with the talent acquisition team, right? So a lot of companies may, uh, this may be their first data hire. Some companies they're hiring to um, fill some, uh, someone that left or that is leaving. Um, and sometimes it's just because we need another data person on another team on the team, right? So these are our needs. Let's identify those. Moving forward, then we go into the sourcing and screening process. So that's where the recruiter comes in, the recruiting team, and that can be um, you have your talent engagement leave, you have your um, talent advisor, your recruitment, um, your sourcers, you have your also your um, uh, coordinators. So that is a huge team and. After the hiring manager meets with this team, then they are um, in responsible for identifying the must haves and the nice to haves, and then finding the candidates that are a close match. And if they do find those great candidates, they move forward in the interview and offer stages, which I kind of like to put those together because hopefully they come rather quickly, especially today. Um, it is such a candidates market out there. It is crazy hiring a lot, which is great. Um, Approved candidates, they uh, continue to move forward in the process and they will have, um, they will have their tech screenings, uh, et cetera. But what is really important to highlight here is the candidate profiles, the way they communicate, um, if they're a culture fit, what their comp ranges are, um, and how they're being viewed at the different stages of the interviews and also at the offer, which leads me to my final, which is going to be the hiring and onboarding. So candidates negotiate, hopefully, they negotiate with what they can and, and when an offer is accepted, then we begin the onboarding. And this can also be very costly and time consuming. And so it, a lot of um, hiring managers will take their time in this. So what I kind of wanted to talk about real quick is how this is a game of telephone. Um, which is where I like to I kind of come in and I'm like, okay, this is where we have to start identifying these gaps. So you have the need and then that is communicated, right? So if someone identifies a need and it communicates that to the recruiter or recruiting team, and then the recruiting team communicates that internally to their team, as well as to a candidate. And so the candidate then comes and communicates their experience on how it fits with the role given the job description and their interaction with the recruiter. And then the recruiter goes back and relays that back to the hiring manager. So all of that in the first stages of hiring on its own, we've already lost a little bit of information there, a little bit of nuance. So um, let's kind of dive in and see how, how far we can get into identifying some of these gaps. I know that there are a lot out there. So um, identifying the gaps. The first I wanna talk about is the hiring side. And what are the problems here? And let's start with the hiring manager, just because I like to call out, you know, the uppers right here on the beginning. Let's just get it out of the way. A hiring manager can really be anyone. Um, they, uh, so who they are and what knowledge or experience or resources they possess, that's kind of um, that's that's kind of ambiguous at the beginning, right? They can be anyone from like an individual co contributor to a CTO to um, maybe they're the CEO uh, and maybe, and what are they looking for? Maybe they're looking for someone like themselves, someone exactly like for themselves. I've seen that several times. It's like, I am, I am a data scientist from NASA and I'm looking to hire someone exactly like me. Well, let's, let's broaden our search a little bit. That maybe, maybe that's you're pigeonholing something um, uh, or um, they're looking to replace someone that left. Uh, so they want to define those exact skills in their job description, right? And this is uh, maybe this is the first data role. So they have no idea what they're really looking for. Do we need an analyst? Do we need an engineer? Do we need a, a data scientist? I think we need a data scientist. We need a data scientist that just can do the full stack data scientists, right? <laughs> they can do everything. Um, and then there are a lot of job descriptions that can be too vague that they don't go into many details and then, um, or they can be a little too comprehensive, which can take us both directions, like finding a needle in a haystack or finding anyone that matches the, the vague job description. That brings me to um, the data science team. So hopefully uh, it, if it is your first role, you're getting to um, meet a data science team. If not, you're, um, you're going to be the, you know, the sole data science uh, department of one. 
but um, these, they need to be able to assess how you work cross-functionally. And then they're gonna be the ones probably uh, evaluating or conducting any kind of tech screens, right? So they wanna see how you work um, and how you will work with them. And uh, if you're, I don't want to say combative, that's not the word I want to, you know, like how, how you, how you are open to these situations and what size is it? Like how many are on this data science team and what are their roles and what are their functions and where does your role fit in? Um, does it exist? Um, does it exist at all? Are you going to be a data scientist of one? And if so, who are you reporting to? Who are you talking to? Um, uh, what questions are you answering and from where are they coming? And that leads us to the recruitment team, which is all on the hiring side. This is all on the hiring side. Um, and just to um, reiterate, these are not data scientists. They have no, um, no background in machine learning and um, they have, their job is to screen the candidates based on what they know or the information that they have. Um, so basically, let's just assume that they have no stats background or programming knowledge and um, that they're going through these job descriptions and pulling out keywords. Then they go to LinkedIn or they go to GitHub to try to find these keywords. Um, I need someone who does random forest. Random forest, that is an important thing for this job description. How many data scientists do you know that do random forest? Everyone, All, everyone has tried their hand at a random forest model, I'm sure. Um, but being it, that doesn't mean that it's not useful or that it's not um, it's not important to that role. It just means that this hiring manager or this um, recruiter doesn't know necessarily what that has to do with the job, right? Um, so they'll be able to tick some boxes and understand on a very high level, um, a very high overview, uh, what the job entails and how it relates to your skills, but. When you speak to a project, they will be able to evaluate your process, which is what they can garner from it. This leads me to the other side, which is going to be the candidate side. And the candidates um, can be from different levels. So I kind of did a little breakdown here. Uh, I'm hoping to target this mostly to candidates here, right? So um, at the junior level or entry level, we all know that one of the biggest problems out there is that years of experience which is crazy. So you're coming in, you're junior, you just finished maybe um, your undergrad, your master's or your PhD, and that all falls under the same category of entry level, right? Going into this career shift. Um, I like to think that there's a rule of thumb. If you have uh, a PhD and one year of experience, then you have five years experience in my book. That doesn't, that's not cross the board to every hiring manager. If you have a master's and two or three years of experience, that also equals five years experience. Um, but again, this is something that I spend time teaching hiring managers because they see, okay, they did their PhD, they did um, their research uh, role, and now they're looking for their first role. That doesn't say experience to me. And I'm like, but, but <laughs> they were working as a software engineer before this, or they were, they had these other skills. So let's, maybe not um, roll, take them out of the game first. Um, the other thing for the entry level is what industry do you wanna work in? Maybe you spent your whole time um, going through like a, a boot camp or, or your degrees and you don't know, you weren't specific about building, going into a specific industry. Like um, was it finance? Are you looking for um, some sort of medical? Like maybe targeting those kinds of um, projects in your um, and your interest is is very important. Um, and that's exactly leads me to my next point. My projects um, you need to highlight for your role. So if you are looking to get into finance, you should probably be targeting your projects to do finance. Um, if you are hoping to do some sort of predictive analysis with um, time series analysis, maybe do more time series analysis. NLP, same thing. Um, those as well. So. That brings me to the broader category here that we have across all hires. And that's gonna be, um, first we'll talk technical interviews don't always uh, screen for what you will be doing in the role, which is an issue we have, and it, maybe that should be on the hiring side. But um, so being prepared for those, those all level of um, programming 
uh, screens is challenging. But the biggest concern that I have and that I've seen is that data science uh, is such a broad umbrella name that it covers so many subcategories that data scientists at one company will be called something completely different at another company. Or, and no one is going to see that. If a hiring manager has been in their role for a long time and they know I am the director of data science and I hire data scientists and data engineers, maybe they haven't seen the, um, the uh, let's not switching, there we go the possible 4,900 current working data-related titles. So this is a, uh, a project I pulled from uh, someone, I've linked it up here, um, which, and I have the browser open as well, so I'm happy to click on it. He pulled from his 7,500 contacts on, on uh, LinkedIn, 4,900 different titles working in data and analytics. That is, crazy and leads to so much ambiguity. But, um, I don't want to keep dwelling on this, but you know, I tried to do a little bit of my uh, NLP work, you know, pre-processing some of this. I'm like, well, what if we take off manager? And what if we take off senior and chief? And like, and you still have over a thousand. So, I mean, like we're still looking at a lot and that is just from his research from this one project. That's uh, really identifying those is a key on every level, on the hiring side, on the candidate side. It's really important to remember that. So next, I think that kind of leads me into how do we set ourselves apart? And there we go. Uh, data science candidates, given what we know, what makes a great candidate stand out in the hiring process? And I have a couple of key principles that I really just wanna mention here. Be excited. So the first thing that I said uh, when I started talking was, I am so excited to be here. Amber said it several times as I was getting on. I'm so excited. I, it is so important whenever you're interviewing or whenever you're contacting or networking is just like, be excited, say it, you'll feel it. I'm, every time I say I'm excited, I get, I'm, I'm excited. Like I'm happy. Um, and it also gives you that in on how to get to know the recruiter or the hiring manager or the company, like be excited and entertained by it. Uh, and also say it. <laughs> um, I had that advice uh, a while ago. It was, um, and ever every interview I've had since then. Uh, oh, I see there's a question. Um, I am so sorry. I didn't see your question until right now. Uh, can you elaborate why you think that it's a candidate's market? Oh, I will go back to that. I absolutely will. Um, uh, but right now, let's see. I can't get it out. There we go. Okay. But so, <laughs> um, Yes, being excited. So, and also to network. A lot of jobs always, this is, no, this is not anything new. It is who you know, and that has not changed. It is who you know, and we don't know necessarily everyone, but we can get behind a screen and we can message them and say, I see you're hiring. I'd love to, I'd love to understand more. Um, be curious, ask questions to your community and engage in networking groups not just because it's something um, it's something that we should all be doing, we just growing and learning, continuing, but also because people see that. Recruiters will go on these forums and see, oh, they, they are asking these questions. They seem like a good candidate. They'll do these re the research and they're looking for you. They're looking for you, but you have to be an active participant there as well. Um, learn about the new techniques in libraries and speak to them. Um, several interviews that I've conducted, it's, you know, I'm not, I'm not familiar with this, but I've actually just started a tutorial. I'm learning about it. Like it, sh it really speaks volumes to, um, to be curious. The next one I will say is be prepared. We, I mean, it's like a Boy Scout phrase, right? Be prepared, I think. <laughs> Always be prepared to talk about your skills on a non-technical level, because that first phone screen is going to be with a recruiter who um, doesn't have the technical background that you do. And also your, um, your stakeholders might not have that. So that communication, how you first establish it and practice saying it is also going to translate into how your final interviews are going to go with some of the higher stakeholders that um, possibly. Um, post everything on LinkedIn, GitHub and your portfolio. It doesn't matter if it's a practice, 
people like to see how you work and that's where they're going to find you. And if you're active, they're going to find you in these areas as well. Uh, and enter competitions and challenges. Um, that, that has, I have seen hires happen from competitions it's, or, or their projects that they have worked on and being able to speak to them in an, in an interview or building that project for a specific interview. That sets you really apart from anyone. It's really important to, that you are able to continue growing and going in that direction. And then the last thing I have under this category is have questions. And I have, I have about like eight or 10 questions that are, they're not your, um, so what is your culture like? Or it's, you know, which are important questions, but it's more like, tell me about your company culture in three words. And it gets them engaged, makes them think, uh, or what's your management style? Uh, or what's the management style of the person I'd be reporting to? Um, I, have, I have several different questions. I'm happy to share them. And they should be applicable across the board to different, different roles. Be honest. Um, this one, actually, my mentor helped me with this one because uh, it's, it's really important. But if you don't know, ask. And we should be able to. And that's part of that going back and like putting yourself on these on, on um, Stack Overflow or something like that. Like if you don't know, you should be able to ask or you should know where to go to ask. So if you're in an interview and you don't, you shouldn't be Googling in your interview. That's, um, that's something I have, I have heard about. I haven't seen it myself, but I have heard that um, people are Googling in their interview um, and it can just really, it doesn't speak well to how you perform in the, in the role, but also be honest with the hiring manager. Um, and they wanna know what you know and how you can showcase that and your willingness to learn and to grow in that role as well. And lastly, I'll say, be helpful. As I mentioned in the beginning, the first phone call with that, with that recruiter is not a data scientist. So answering the questions on, on Stack Overflow, getting engaged that way, but also to answer the recruiter questions. Um, this came up recently, I think uh, we were talking about um, a, a role or something that asked for Google Cloud Platform and your experience levels with it. And it was with a recruiter and instead of saying like, I don't know that, or I'm, I'm really not familiar, say, actually I've worked a lot with AWS or I'm more familiar with this. And did you, did you know that they were, they were similar? I don't wanna, you don't ever speak down to them, but like maybe you can teach each other, like we can teach each other. And I think that that is incredibly helpful. And let's see, what else did I have? Um, yeah, that's really, that's um, the rest, the rest of my, presentation. So I am happy to go back and answer questions or <laughs> was that helpful and informative or <laughs> ah, I think that was really great. I think that was super helpful and informative. And again, just wanted to thank you for taking the time for putting that presentation together. Absolutely. So I think we're at the point right now where, you know, I really want to encourage folks to like ask questions. I know we already have some questions in the Q&A. So we'll start with that first. Um, we have a question from William and he mentioned, can you please elaborate why you think it's a candidate's market? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's, everyone is hiring. They're calling it the great resignation, right? And it is happening across the board and they are hiring quickly. So, um, if someone doesn't get back to you in two or three weeks, that is that we have seen that candidates fall out. Candidates are like taking other offers. They're accepting other offers in the middle of a hiring process. You are able to negotiate, which is great because then you can negotiate um, uh, the best that you can with different companies. But it is absolutely, um, I will say, I don't know if that's answering with the most information, but that is how I see it as the candidates market. You are owning this this job, um, this hiring process right now. Yeah, just to piggyback on that, um, a lot of the data that we've seen on the back end really points in this direction. Um, in many ways, there's never been more leverage in the applicant side as there is now. And so that really plays to, to all of your guys' uh, advantage. And I highly recommend that, that you leverage that and kind of keep be cognizant of that as you go through it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. Um, and we have another question in the chat, actually, which is somewhat related. So uh, what suggestions do you have for entry level or junior, um, junior roles? Yeah, um, 
I've, I've had some pretty great uh, resources on this. And sometimes it's like, okay, applying for something that you're overqualified for, get in there and get that conversation. Tell them what you can do, what you're capable of doing, um, but also to continue networking and be, and as I mentioned, be honest, like this is where I am. This is where I'd like to see. I think I could learn a lot from your team. I think I could grow in this role. Um, remember that, well, there are certain companies that are going to be a little bit more strict about what's in their job description and what is required. Um, but a lot of them are just nice to haves. A lot of the, those details will be nice to haves. And then there are a lot that are, there are smaller must haves. If you know R and they are calling for Python, they're going, and you can, you know, you have a little familiarity, you have that, that leeway to say, I am familiar with it. I'll need a little ramp up, but I can do this, you know, um, have that willingness. I think that's important also hard agree on, on all of that. Uh, sort of the, the canonical as some advice on this is if you are looking at a job description that you're like reasonably enthusiastic about and you meet like 50% of the qualifications, you should apply. Um, part of the reason is exactly what you just said, Sarah, like a lot of these requirements are more nice to have and more of a wish list than like, oh, hard requirements. So a, a lot of job posts will even delineate these like, oh, bonus points if X, but like these are the hardcore requirements. Uh, but also, um, there's a lot to be said about maintaining a certain application throughput as you're going through it. Um, and one last thing that I want to uh, uh, emphasize on, the, on this theme is um, this is something we got from another mentee who we interviewed a while back, um, Billy Hines, I believe, uh, or Hayes. I'm, I could be uh, butchering that. Apologies, Billy. But basically, what he said was like, there were a few times where I found myself in an interview for a job that I was woefully underqualified for. And he's like, I had like this brief moment of like, oh man, I am not, like I'm not qualified for this. But then he transformed that into what can I learn right now? Like, what are some good questions that I can throw out there to be like, make the most out of this time, like for myself and the interviewer. And so you should definitely not be afraid to apply for roles that you think I may be a little bit underqualified for this because at the very least, like you'll, like worst case scenario, you won't hear back, but that's okay. That's part of the course of, of hunting for jobs. But maybe, just maybe you're in an interview and you can learn a ton from the other person and like maybe you don't get the job, but that's still worthwhile experience for you. Yeah, I agree. Honestly, I think even the act of interviewing is just like a really good learning process. And I think, um, you know, Sarah, you touched on this earlier, like data science is so broad, like you can basically throw you questions from like anywhere, kind of like depending on the job that you're applying for. I remember when I was applying like some interviews and these are all like data science roles like all of them have the same like title some of them would be like hardcore stats some of them would be like lead code and some would be like completely different like business cases and it was just like all over the place you know so I definitely agree with that sentiment um so related to something that you mentioned earlier uh, you talked a little bit about um the gaps within like the hiring side so do you have any tips on ways that you know applicants or mentees can showcase their skills more clearly um, to the data science team, you kind of talked a little bit about like personal branding, like, you know, posting on like LinkedIn, GitHub, also just like Stack Overflow and like having a website. Like, are there any kind of like low hanging fruit there? Anything people should prioritize or just post everywhere? Um, I don't know if you have like general thoughts on that. Yeah, um, well, that is the tricky part is that recruiters are looking, we're looking wherever we can find them. Um, so, I mean, I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn right now but I have um, uh, some colleagues that look on Dice and they look on um, uh, networking groups and they look on GitHub um, and we'll go through those things. So if you can post everywhere, do, but also include it in your resume. Put your, like if you're junior and you don't have um, necessarily corporate experience or the other kind of experience, put your projects on there, what you've worked on, what skills you learned. Um, also link to your link to your GitHub or your, um, your portfolio website, your LinkedIn. And keep it updated. As I as I've mentioned about LinkedIn, and I, I'm harp I'm harping on this because I have had several recruiters I know that are like, if they're not on LinkedIn, they don't exist. Um, but also, I have had um, hiring managers pass on applicants who didn't feel like their um, their LinkedIn matched what they were looking for. After after I'm vouching for them, I said I'm like, I just had a conversation with this person. They have had they have these skills. They have this. Um, background, I send them a resume or a LinkedIn profile and they pass. Um, and, and that can be hard. Like I'm said, I'm advocating for these people, but um, if you don't put it out there, if you don't put it, if it's not findable, if it's not searchable, um, 
it's really hard to uh, to pass that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so much of the, of the advice that we give mentees is, is all about like, make your value legible to economic decision makers. And there's a bunch of different ways to go about it. And it's slightly different from like, if you're making legible to a recruiter, to a hiring manager, but you're optimizing for both simultaneously. Um, for recruiters, there's a lot of like superficial signals that they rely on because a lot of them are not technical, like you were alluding to earlier, Sarah, uh, for hiring managers that are technical, like they'll be focusing more on like, okay, give me some evaluation metrics. How good was that uh, model that you built? And how did that relate to like whatever the state of the art might be, for example, whereas a recruiter would be like, oh, wow, you built this thing that saved like 10 engineering hours a week. I, I know how much the engineers on my team make. That's, that's money. That's like, yeah. that's a Delta. And so by kind of putting, quantifying some of the value that, that you create, even if you're estimating it, that makes it a little bit more legible. Um, that's a little, getting a little bit into the weeds of things, but it's just something that, that uh, resonated with me a lot. Yeah, I agree. And kind of to build on what you guys said, I think one thing that I have learned um, in my own like application process is like, you know, you have to kind of be your biggest fan and you have to like, nobody knows your impact more than you do, right? And you have to like get that across when you're interviewing. And for me, it was like kind of like a tough, um, it was a tough like change in like perspective because I'm not used to like doing that. But it's definitely something I learned along the way. And like a lot of my mentors here at Sharpest Minds and, you know, my peers also help. Um, so related to that, um, we have another question in the Q&A. So can you introduce some good practices for networking in the job hunting process? And kind of as a follow up question to that, you um, mentioned hiring manager versus um, recruitment team. Who should we reach out to or like cold email? Um, wh what are your suggestions, general best practices there? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, if you can access the hiring manager, I would say absolutely get to them, get to them because you'll skip that recruiter phone screen. You'll go right into the hiring, um, the interview process. But uh, I, I, again, I'm, just because it's such an easy tool, LinkedIn, it, you can find the you can find out who the hiring manager is, who's recruiting for that. Research the company, do your research on the company, and um, reach out to them. Just to have you have to remember that they're people, and they want to get those jobs filled just like you want a job, right? They absolutely. I mean, and and they they should be approachable. And if they're not approachable, maybe it's not the right position for you. <laughs> um, so absolutely reaching out to them, sending them a, a connection request with a little message, just like I researched this company. I really find it um, interesting. I would love to pick your brain about it. Do you have 15 minutes for a phone call? Something, um, uh, give them the option to either communicate uh, on in a message or, or on the phone or on Zoom um, and get that face-to-face -face if you can, because then you're a person you move from being just a name on a page to an actual person. Um, on top of that, I will say that uh, I have joined a lot of networking groups. The more specific, like um, I'm in a lot of women in tech networking groups kind of things, um, if you or di diversity in tech, any of those other networking groups where you can also like, there are typically job boards. There are job boards somebody will post a job, direct message them and just send them like, I saw you posted this, I'd love to find out more. Um, talk to them because clearly they posted it because it's important to them, right? Um, but also people like to talk about themselves. So when you're messaging them, I mean, we all do, we all like to talk about ourselves. Um, so if you, if you see, uh, if you message someone, ask them about their experience at the company, how did they get there? How did they get into this role? Um, some really great questions on, on how to network that way. That would be my suggestion, my recommendations. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's a really good, like underrated tip. And it's something that I learned when I was like reaching out to people, like asking about, you know, like, what is your company like? Like, I think the easiest way to get folks to talk to you is to like ask them about themselves. And like, I, like when I realized that it was just like, yeah. wow, the world has been unlocked. <laughs> <laughs> So we have another question in the Q&A, um, specifically about machine learning roles. So can you give an idea regarding machine learning um, screening for these diverse roles? For, um, well, and that is, uh, that's the challenge, right? Some, some companies, they're going to put you in a situation and want to just hear how you whiteboard the problem, right? Um, specifically, there are other companies that will have a take home, you know, like this is, and 
I, I would always suggest no matter if it's a take home or um, asking questions and making sure that you're engaging throughout that process. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering this question. So I think actually, uh, if I'm parsing this correctly, I think what Maria was asking is, um, given that there's like all this diversity of all these titles in different roles, how do machines screen for them? Like, like ATS software mm. and stuff like, how oh, can okay. we, yeah, how can we kind of account for that diversity and make sure that we're like visible and legible to, to the software doing the initial pass? There are, there are some great websites out there that will actually, you can paste the job description and um, a resume and your resume and make sure it will tell you, I'm gonna have to look up what it's called, but it will give you the amount of times that the keywords pop up in your resume and that will, that will keep it in the list. Um, that is, and it's a free source, you can use it so many times and then you might have to pay. Um, but I think that's like monthly, you get a couple of free times a month or something. Um, that's one way. Uh, the mm -hmm. other way is to just visually do that before you apply you and it takes a little bit more time but to target your resume or your cover letter to what is in their job description. So if they say random forest specifically put it in your make sure it is in your resume or um, somewhere that those will be seen. So I think you just gave me a phenomenal idea for a feature request for one of our products. So <laughs> I think this is definitely something we, we want to emulate because at its core, it sounds like it's basically you're just the first pass is just keyword matching. So if you have sufficient of the keywords that are like rank order and there's enough like net relevance, then you, okay, you make it to the next level. And so being able to kind of do that on the fly, uh, but like recognizing like whatever you put on your resume is fair game in an interview. I think making it easier for folks to kind of identify, okay, we, this is a good fit. I think like this is enough keyword value, like send it, or like we need to tweak this or add this skill or like make emphasize this. Be able to do it on the fly or automatically. That would be a cool product. Anyway, sorry, I'm going to product ideation mode. <laughs> I'll stop it there before, before I go down too much of a rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, and I think those tips are also very helpful. Thank you so much for clarifying that question. I think it's really important to know, like, you know, what can mentees actually do with their resumes um, and their profiles to help uh, avoid being screened out? So as a follow-up question, uh, we talked about resume screening. Um, do folks also screen LinkedIn's? Is that something that happens or is it mostly like resumes that are screened? Like, should we also focus on, on that aspect as well? Yeah, um, I will say both. I have a LinkedIn recruiter seat. <laughs> so. Uh <laughs> that's, uh, that's probably why I talk about it so much. No, I, I can uh -huh. look at a different version of your exact profile, which is going to give me a little bit more information and also connect me to you. So um, it it is, I, I find it very important to do that. And a lot of recruiters do, a lot of tech mm -hmm. recruiters um, specifically use LinkedIn for their recruiter seat um, options. And yes, the yeah. resume you will submit when you are submitting for jobs. But if you're going to be scouted, and sometimes that's what we're doing mm -hmm. on our end, is we are kind of headhunting, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what we're looking at. That's why those, those um, the GitHub also, uh, is it GitHub or uh, it's another one that, that, um, uh, that uses the same mm -hmm. um, profile. You have your profile and you have a recruiter seat and you can also look at candidates through that and then you get contacted by them. Yeah, this is this is spot on. Um, so all of our advice for how to optimize your LinkedIn profile is how to is opt, is like oriented towards like have recruiters reach out to you. Like, what do you need to do to do that? And so we have very tactical advice that shows you like, okay, this is the rank ordering of things that are like visible to recruiters in your in your LinkedIn profile, and this is what matters. Like for example, if you have a profile picture, you're like thirty times more likely to get a research than if you don't. Your headline is the most visible part of, of your profile. Then your about section um, has to map some of the skills that you're looking for and then your experience section below that. And so we, we sort of like make our advice as tactical as possible. And we even give you examples of people that have gotten hired because recruiters reached out to them. So yeah, hard agree with everything that Sarah is saying. Yeah. Yeah, I also just wanted to take a moment to highlight if you guys haven't already seen the resources on like the actual Sharpest Minds website, um, a lot of um, what Alejandro and Sarah uh, are describing are also listed there in like a lot of details. So definitely go through it. I used a lot of those tips when I was applying. Um, so definitely go through it as well. And, and the examples are really helpful as well. Um, so we have another question. I actually really like this question because I think this is you know, something that a lot of people who are switching careers or going into data science from something else um, have asked. 
So what is your experience in evaluating applicants who have shifted to data science from a non-math or stats, CS, physics, engineering, or IT field? Um, that is a tough one. I actually was working with a colleague who was hiring for, um, I think it was a research scientist. And so the hiring manager had given specific, like, these are the only degrees you need to look at, like, mm -hmm. which is that also challenging. Like if this person has 10 years experience or well, let's not say 10 years, let's say six years experience of, of being a research scientist, um, but they don't have a stats degree or an engineering degree, um, that specific company, it's not going to be great. But I, I will say that um, if you are identifying your transferable skills in a way that is um, relevant, then that is what's most important. Um, that's what that's what I'm looking for uh, in when I'm looking at these roles to fill. Because um, again, it depends on on the hiring manager, and it depends. Um, as I mentioned, there. You know, if you're a NASA data scientist looking for a NASA data scientist, you know, like that's there's no way um, I can make recommended recommendations, but I can't necessarily change everyone's mind. But at the same time, there are roles out there. It is a hiring it is a hiring frenzy right now. So there are roles out there for everyone. Um, I I truly believe that, and I think that just making sure to include your transferable skills and and how they're transferable. I, I opened this presentation saying I'm an opera singer, but I've been, and I've been working with my mentor on saying this, like um, I have been doing analytics my entire career. And um, yeah, and if you wanna know more, I will, I'm happy to share it and I'm happy to dive in, but like making sure that it is communicated that yes, this is what I did. I found that I love this and this is why. Absolutely. Uh, one thing that I'd like to add to that is, it's become somewhat like a, it was at least a common trope for people to be like, oh, I come from a non-traditional background, AKA I didn't do a CS undergrad. And so, but the interesting thing is, is like in the last maybe year or two years, so many folks have done this transition that there is no such thing as a traditional background anymore. So like, this is something that's kind of shifted and in, in more of favor of people that like don't have the, again, that traditional background. Uh, so you have a bit of that tailwind going. Um, so just kind of zooming out to the macro. Going down the stack a little bit, um, our canonical advice on this is at the end of the day, the decision to hire you is basically boils down to a very a somewhat simple calculus, which is like, will the value of this person generates for the organization exceed the value they capture with a compensation package? If that's a positive delta, that's a pretty simple reason. The more positive, the more obvious the, the decision. And so you want to make that legible to, to the decision makers. And one of the best ways to do that is like, hey, look what I've done in my previous experiences. Even if like, let's say you are... Um, like literally in any type of other role that, that doesn't completely map to the cynical role, there's probably things that you did that improved outcomes in some way, some tangible uh, improvement of, on some percentage points on some key part of the process. And so making that and highlighting that in your resume allows you to tell a story of like, no, I improved like the unit economics for this like last organization that I worked with, even if it was like not even a business, maybe it was a, a charity or an academic institution, whatever the case is, if you make that legible, you can begin telling a story about like, here's the a higher probability that I'll be able to do that again in your organization. Cause that's like the best predictor of being able to do that in the future is that you've done it in the past. Yeah, I agree. And I also just wanted to kind of mention that, you know, this was when I was like applying to my first job. So I come from like an archaeology background, like I literally like wrote papers, not code, you know, um, it was something that like intimidated me. Like my first job was actually on your list uh, a while ago of like data science related jobs. So it was like a risk analyst. Right. And I was really nervous about applying because I was like, oh, my God, like archaeology background, like you know, we're not like digging up like artifacts and stuff like that. But because I had done like research and like um that sort of like type of work before, like data related research in the past, um that was something that was transferable. So I think like as you both mentioned, that he is like highlighting what skills uh, you've done and like what you have and like what's relevant to like your new job. And yeah, it was like it was a great job. <laughs> so yeah, definitely. Uh, I uh, just wanted to encourage folks to like apply to DS roles, even if you don't have a quote unquote like STEM related degree. Um, yeah, so I just, I want to echo that one, one more bit, Amber, because I think it's so important. Like, it's so easy to think that like your background, because it doesn't map to CS or something is like somehow a disadvantage, quite the opposite. Like the fact that you have, that, like 
you come from a different background actually gives you an advantage because it means you, you approach problems and you think differently. And that is very valuable to a team that's like essentially trying to innovate some offering, some service or product in the market. And so being able to like turn that quote unquote weakness into uh, an advantage is like a narrative override that you should like go into an interview with with like, yeah, no, I, like, for example, sorry, I love the way that you open things with like, yeah, I'm, I'm an opera singer. Like that immediately begs like, whoa, tell me more. That's just not what I was expecting. And that like expectations of version is a great way to just draw attention to yourself in a positive way during an interview. So anyway, just wanted to echo that. Yeah, and also the fact that kind of like data science is really applied in various domains, I think that really helps. So for example, like Sarah, you mentioned like NLP earlier. I think more and more there, there seems to be a trend of, of, you know, folks coming from like humanities or like policy backgrounds because like we do like a ton of like reading like long papers and, and uh, like thinking about like text and like language and like how you, you know, portray like culture and, and heritage in in those majors and I think they really do help like when you're looking at like language as well so yeah um cool so ask another question in our Q&A and uh we are like hitting like the last 12 minutes of our uh, webinar so just wanted to again highlight if you guys have any questions feel free to either um ask us in the chat ask us in the Q&A or like raise your hand and we will um unmute you so this one is from Sagar. So do you suggest that we put exercises we have done, for example, on GitHub, uh, in Kaggle, on GitHub? Like, do you suggest that the things we've done on other websites, we add it on GitHub? That's a great question. Um, I, that's a great question. I, I don't know a lot of, um, and I, I will say that Kaggle, I think, is, is more, um, I don't know any recruiters that are looking on Kaggle. It doesn't mean that, they're, that they aren't. Um, it just means that they might not see it. So I think the more cross posting that you can do is helpful, but also reiterate that in your post. Like this, it was from my contribution on Kaggle or something mm -hmm. on the lines because uh, again, different recruiters are looking in different locations. Um, and I, that's a really, that's a good point. Like I should make sure that we're looking on, um, I, I do know people that have gotten hired from different competitions, but, um, but they're not always looking in those places. So. Yeah, I think that's, that's also spot on. Um, also great question, Sigar. Um, the only thing that I can think to add to that is, um, Adding stuff to your GitHub makes it more easily legible to recruiters because GitHub just it has a, a deeper center of gravity than, for example, Kaggle to most recruiters. And like LinkedIn has like an even deeper center of gravity. So you want to kind of rank ordering your visibility accordingly. But what I would say is on GitHub, um, GitHub is where a lot of hiring managers will go to like, let's see the quality of your code and how you kind of approach this. And one of the things the hiring managers are going to be looking for is proof of work. So for example, if you have like a Titanic data set from Kaggle on your GitHub, um, it's unclear whether that's like your original work or something that you just basically followed a tutorial and just replicated it. And that's not to say that it is or isn't, but the fact that you pose the, like that, that generates the question in the hiring manager's uh, head, like discounts your candidacy for the role significantly. So what I would say is you can have like a folder of like cow competitions and you can go all the way to like toy little projects, but I would make sure that you make your most impressive work the, the most visible and you have that like up top and you point to that like even in your like read me um, and like make that as as like visible as possible so that you draw attention to the things that um, differentiate you the most from everyone else that they could be looking at as a candidate. Yeah, I think those are really good tips. And I think that's also something that like I would ask myself multiple times because I would hear different things in grad school. Like there were there's like one camp that was like, okay, we need to do like one cattle competition every month. And they were like super intense about it. And there's like another camp that's more like, oh, you know, like we should like look for um different like data sets. So I think there's like a lot of, of ways to put it together. And I think those tips that you both mentioned are really, really helpful for thinking about this. Um, I think, sorry, sorry. I think you, I'm sorry, Amber, my apologies. I think you just oh, literally hit on the whole resin detra of sharpest minds, which is there is an infinite ways to, to, to get a job in data science. And what we do is we have the, we have the luxury of being able to field test this across a network of people and look at the data and be like, oh, this is actually generating interviews like three times as much as this other thing. Let's, let's tell folks like the rank ordering of this advice. Like you could go this way or you could try this that's working like really well and like start there. You should run your own experiments, but then being able to look at it across the network allows us to like basically tell folks, hey, this is what seems to be working the most in the last six months. Maybe start there. Great, 
Yeah, I agree. And also one thing that I like found super valuable about Trappist Minds personally is like a lot of these things, like the, the, tr the trends change, you know, so like being aware of what's happening right now might not have worked in the past, might not work in the future. But if you're applying right now, this is what's working for like a lot of people. So yeah, exactly. Exactly. So like right now, like recruiters are, are spending a lot of time on LinkedIn and some on GitHub, maybe two years from now, they're gonna be spending a ton of time on Kaggle. And like, we'll know about it and we'll advise you according. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like super grateful for this community. I like, it's been really great personally for my career. So I appreciate you guys so much. So um, glad to hear that. Thank you. So related to this platform um, conversation. So how does Twitter figure in getting seen by hiring managers? That's another really interesting trend. Like I only started using Twitter for data science, honestly. So yeah. What are you guys' thoughts on, on Twitter? I, Sorry. I, uh, go, if you want to, the only thing I know is that I have for other tech roles, I've seen a lot of hiring on Twitter, um, not specifically for data scientists, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, so my exposure is limited on that. Um, so I've recently begun investing in Twitter, mostly because like, um, well, actually, uh, so I got this job basically via Twitter. Like I joined Sharpest Minds and it all started with a Twitter interaction because it was like a friend of mine told me about uh, Edward and Jeremy and I'm like okay and I followed them on Twitter I'm like wow these guys are so smart and then like I sent them a message and we started dialogue and then like a little while later they were hiring and anyway the to me like the, the real value of Twitter is like the DMs like you can literally have a chat with some of the most brilliant people on the planet via Twitter it can also be a cesspool of like a bunch of like really hateful people like <laughs> it's social media you get you know you get like the best of, of, of the best and the worst of humanity in one place what I will say is um, this applies to social media in general. There is a lot of value, especially if you're earlier in your career and you don't have a lot of other experience where you're coming from a non-technical field about building in public. So one of my favorite stories about this is from a, a, another mentee who is now a data scientist at Shopify, uh, Sifu. Sifu did the 100 days of code challenge on Twitter and LinkedIn. And it's like, it's, almost trite as advice, but so few people do it that it's so valuable. You just immediately stand out from the crowd. Mm -hmm. And so if you decide to go this route, I would say do it on LinkedIn and also cross post on Twitter. You have nothing to lose. And maybe like, basically you're just, you're just increasing the probability that you'll get eyes from someone who can decide to give you a job at some point down the road. So that's sort of the way that I approach it. It's like you're incrementally increasing probabilities, but there is no silver bullet. Yeah, I agree. And also, it's kind of cool that you got the job through Twitter because I actually met like Jeremy and Ed through Twitter too. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's how I became a mentee because, like, <laughs> yeah, I literally like met them on Twitter. Um, but yeah, so I think those are really like great tips. And, and yeah, I cannot, um, you know, kind of like let you guys know how helpful this has been for me personally as well. Um, so related to this, we talked about different ways to, to be more visible, to kind of show your value and to really just show your interest in a company. Another question that I feel like a lot of mentees ask and that I've also asked myself is like, do you generally recommend that applicants write cover letters? How effective are they? And, you know, if they are effective, what should mentees even include in a cover letter? That is, um, and, and the way of the cover letter seems to be going out as we're getting more and more of these, um, these, you know, ATS systems that just kind of filter these things out. But um, I will say every time there is a cover letter, I read it. And I know that I'm not the only recruiter out there that does that. I have seen um, multiple times that um, recruiters through Amazon specifically um, do that as well. Like they have to read through everything. But it's also, it's like a breath of fresh air because you're looking at someone just kind of going through skills and what they've done. And, but a cover letter is a little bit more personal. Um, and I, I would say have a template that you can just revise um, and add a couple of details that are, that stand out to you. And you don't have to do it for every company if you don't want to, but if you want to stand out, I would absolutely include, include a, that cover letter, just a couple of lines and uh, include something about your background. Um, maybe it gives you a chance to include a sentence or two about how you transitioned into this new career field, right? What we were just talking about. But also it talks about how you'd be excited to fit into this company. Um, I always suggest never longer than like three, maybe four paragraphs. I wouldn't do much more than that. 
um, just because we have a lot of <laughs> applications to read through. Um, and I will stop to read your cover letter. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, make it brief again, make it about them and how you would make them better and contribute. I think um, that's what I would say about cover letters. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, okay, a few things. Um, because more and more of the hiring decision, uh, or at least the initial hiring decision, reduces down to keywords on an ATS filter, cover letters will increasingly differentiate you. So that's one aspect of it. Another is that cover letters require more effort because you're not just hitting it LinkedIn easy apply. So the way to kind of, um, you want to come at this with an investor's mindset of like, okay, how do I allocate my effort? Uh, remembering that like most of the interactions in the job hunt uh, are probably either going to be silence or rejection. So how do I like manage that expectation, manage my own psychology? And Sarah, I think you, you, you sort of alluded to the, to, to the advice that we, that we give here, which is weighted by expectation value. Like if there's a role that you like really, really want, you think you could be great at, like you think you have the skills, but also it'd be amazing if you land the role. It's okay to invest more of your emotional energy that to the extent of like writing a cover letter or even a cold email, because cover letters and cold emails take you and transform you from an API endpoint to like a story to a human. And so that actually helps you differentiate even further uh, and begin to tell your story and just again, raise the probabilities that you'll make it to the next step. Um, but it comes with a cost, like writing a cover letter, you could spend like an hour writing a good cover letter. And if you never hear back, that can be very demoralizing. So the final bit of tactical advice to kind of bridge this gap is also what Sarah mentioned, um, have a template, have a template that you can easily swap things in and out, like um, have like the beginning of your story, like telling about your background and then make the part where you're uh, expressing your interest for specific reasons about the specific opportunity, make that configurable. And, and then that'll just shave the time. So you're basically expending less emotional energy for more potential upside in a way that's sustainable because you want to consider the job on a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah, I agree. I, I think those are great tips. And also, again, like something that you guys have both touched on earlier is, you know, hopefully like, like we kind of see the folks who are looking at our like resume and cover letter, like they are like people too, you know, and it is like a conversation. Like I, I remember before, like I used to spend some time writing cover letters on like the jobs that I really wanted and there was like this one job for like I think it was like a quant shop that I really wanted but I didn't get and they had sent me a rejection and it's not a cover letter but I had like replied to the email and I was just like oh can you like let me know like how I can like prepare I'm gonna apply again in the future and what they did was they actually brought me for an on-site interview so like it is possible to uh, you know like as long as you're thinking about it as a conversation and again like managing expectations I think is really important so you don't like burn out and get too sad <laughs> it is one thing that I learned as well um so I think we are hitting like the hour so I think we have time for one last question I don't know Alejandro if you have like a question that you want or if you want me to like ask a question but there's like I think time for like one more question before we close off okay um I will take a stab at this um Sarah given everything you know now if there's one piece of advice that you would want the audience to walk away with, um, what might that be? Oh, one piece of advice. Um, be transparent. I think, I think that, would, that would be it because it, on multiple levels, right? Like show what you're working on, show who you are, show your, your willingness to learn. Um, yeah, transparency is, is very important. I love that. I love that. I think that's, that's spot on. And that's not an answer that you hear very often. So I think that is even more resonant. Yeah, I think that's great. And I feel like at the end of the day, like folks are just looking for like people who they genuinely want to work with and build cool products with, you know, like, so I think that's, that's great advice. And so I think with that, we will close off our second um, episode for this webinar series. And again, just wanted to thank all of our attendees for being here, taking your like lunch break with us. If you are in Easter time, if you're not, I guess, thanks for coming in at like midnight. Um, I don't know, this is like a thing. Um, yeah. So thanks for that. And of course, wanted to, to thank Alejandro for like pushing for this initiative and like having us here and Sarah for all the advice that she gave us. I really learned a lot myself and I'm sure everybody else in the audience did too. So stay tuned. We will have more of this in the coming months and we will send updates on our Slack channel.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sarah. This was incredibly helpful. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Amber, for hosting. This is amazing. Appreciate you both. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Me. <laughs> Have a good afternoon, you guys. Bye.